Welcome to Revival Time Hub, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar, it shall never go out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hold hands with someone by your left and right and let's pray in the Spirit for a few minutes. Just draw from the Spirit as an act of faith. You're praying in the Spirit. Pray in the spirit with dedicated focus. Pray in the spirit with your eyes on Jesus. Sada branta ke barato ka pratis ke debelegos. Rato sada blanda krati ke beleke pariyata gatos. Sada branta ka prati ke barato skubriyata baranto sigata. Soli barinta ka priga dia da branta gada. Sadi la branti ke branti ka baroto skubriga da balados. Sati la baranto sobre ke di bala kodish. Impra kodi abraga da braga da baradosh. Sete bala da brada barado da rabosh. Sobra di barato sabrandi ke bala ke brati ke barados. Sate balanta sabrati ke bala ko shadas. Sada brate ke barate ke barato sobra di ke lebranda gadas. Are you praying? Kalibarata kaparada balagata bragada bas. Sabrenta ke barus sade bragada balagata. Sabena ke de balaga de bagada barada daba. Sabela ke pera ke parato prate ke de balada baradus. Sade balenta ke para kata pras kaliga baradus. Sabanda salega barakata, rakata barada baka prande perete ke debos. Sele barata kaparato kaprande ke perete ke balados. Lebran sada balaga da prakata balaka prade. Shada balaga da prakata balaka tos. E manda sali ke Paris e preski balasho pratis kali ke pratis yata. is open to receive and I receive by faith. Go ahead and cry. My heart is open set to receive. My heart is open set to receive. My heart is open set to receive. That means you are ready to grow. That means you are ready to rise. That means you are ready to enter into a new experience in the spirit. Are you praying? My heart is set to receive, void of distraction, set to receive, desperate for more. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. In Jesus' marvelous name, we have prayed. The Bible says, for without faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe, number one, that he exists. So you are not coming before an idol. And then number two, that he's a rewarder. That means every spiritual activity you find yourself engaging in tonight, you know that there is a reward. A rewarder of them 
that daily gently seek him hallelujah blessed be the name of the lord um i know we have prayed but i just want us to pray one last time we're only days away to the sound of revival uk conference i just want us to take a minute one more time hallelujah god has granted us the privilege once again to take his presence his power his word to the nations and um, you never can pray enough so in one minute as a global family i like us to pray father a fresh encounter rest upon your people breathe upon your people rest upon your people Alina shala grogabala kosi bregadia. Rest upon your people. Breathe upon your people. Let your word prevail over the hearts of men. In the name of Jesus, set the captives free. Let yokes be broken. Let destinies be reordered by the Spirit. Let the gospel come with clarity, with precision. Let every dry bone become an exceeding great army set men on fire may they encounter genuine apostolic fire pray for all those who are traveling around the world in the name of Jesus we speak to the air we speak to the road we speak to the sea for their sake we declare safety for their sake we prophesy safety Shadi balako sabrendege balako ziata that it will be an unforgettable encounter in the presence of God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. May the Lord be glorified even in this conference in Jesus' name. Please be seated. Be seated. We began a series, um, a two-part series last week, Greater Light and... Um, I promise that we're going to have another part today to wrap it up and um, we're getting straight to the business of the night and I did promise that I was going to teach us on altars. Um, so we'll be learning a lot but then I must make an admission before we get straight to the teaching that the subject of altars is not one that can be exhausted in one meeting, one service. In fact, quite honestly, while I was, um, you know, just reviewing my notes again, I just felt that hopefully next year God will grant us grace where we have to stretch, you know, days of meetings. This is an apostolic ministry. So to stretch days so that it allows us the justice to deal with certain topics um, else you may not gain the kind of spiritual understanding required to walk in victory but um, because I made that commitment um, would still discuss that subject so we're looking at greater light and um, we may not have the liberty to do all the recap but the essence um, is to be able to bring us into higher and deeper spiritual revelations we considered from Genesis 1 last week how that the Bible says that God made two great lights, two great lights. And then he called one the greater light. And he said that one would rule in the night. And then for the lesser light, it will rule. I mean, rule in the day, the lesser light will rule in the night. And then the Bible says that he made the stars also. So he made two great lights, the greater to rule the day, the lesser, he said, to rule the night um, and we did say that light in scripture speaks of illumination revelation and that light is not at the same extent of illumination if you are in darkness what you need is not greater light what you need is light enough to come out of darkness but once you are out of darkness you need the brightness to continue to increase it is the illumination that turns morning to afternoon to the brightness of afternoon and evening is defined as we know by the depletion of that intensity 
you do not call bright light in the afternoon 12 noon has never been considered nighttime in as much as we know so you literally use the extent of intensity to determine what part of the day you are in if it's pitch darkness you don't call it afternoon in most cases you call it night and sometimes if you don't have the luxury of looking at a timepiece a clock you literally have to depend on light to help you estimate and sometimes you are able to estimate with precision what time of the day you can literally look at the sun shining at its brightest and know that this should be between 12 to 2 a.m and without prophesying you get it right so light can determine seasons light can define moments in time and destiny and we looked at uh, a few things last week particularly zooming down on the creation of man we took man's creation to help us define how we should function uh, in dominion the essence of the teaching last week particularly was to begin to help us understand the foundational components of dominion we said that man was created in the image of God still remember and the likeness of God and we said the image of God talks of his spiritual quality the nature of God are we together as revealed in Christ and then the likeness of God talks about the functionality the functionality how to function like Christ not just the form it talks about the form two hands two feet one head but beyond that it talks of the way God functions and we took our time to say that no believer will walk in dominion if you veer off out of this architecture man was designed to function in a certain way and that the first part of call is that every man must press to see that image find visible expression and i did tell us that the image of god is a compendium of his nature as revealed in his character what we have come to know as the fruit of the spirit that the fruit of the spirit is the resultant um product of that inner working of the holy spirit through the recreated human spirit and that essentially the fruit of the spirit is love manifested as joy peace patience and so on and so forth i told us that the fruit of the spirit is not just a virtue it is an atmosphere the ideal atmosphere designed for man to thrive is called the fruit of the spirit we challenged ourselves by considering how that the deficiency of just one expression of the fruit of the spirit is what has caused a lot of damage in our world for instance the absence of joy hospitals are managing patients in their variety because of depression and a lot of other things just one the absence of one expression of the fruit of the spirit and i did tell us that man's ideal state that allows for maximum uh, optimized function is to function within that zone called the fruit of the spirit then we looked at the likeness of god how to function like god and we said when it has to do with functioning like god you have to understand that the modus operandi in the kingdom is the word of god the word of god is the foundational basis for functioning like god you still remember that if you do not have access to the word of god the speakings of god there is no basis to be able to function like god because in the kingdom everything the believers walk if is to be like god as revealed in christ it must be by the word man shall not live by bread alone matthew 4 4 but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of god hallelujah and we said how that when you want to function like christ uh, there are three dimensions to that operation number one you must learn to speak like christ the first way to function like christ is to speak like christ hallelujah speak like christ now i've lost the scripture there's a scripture coming in my heart is it isaiah 2 20 i cannot remember and if they do not speak after this manner he says it is because there is no light in them very powerful scripture uh, uh, media help me if you can i think that's um isaiah or so 220 or thereabout if you don't find it that's fine that if they do not speak after this manner it is because there is no light thank you 820 if they speak not according to this word 
it is because there is no light in them that means those who are possessors of light there is a way that they speak hallelujah number two the second way we function like god has revealed in christ is obedience 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 and obedience is not valid until there is an instruction to obey the bible says let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus and that mindset was the mindset of obedience obedience even unto death and that there are rewards to obedience wherefore god had so highly exalted him giving him a name an office that is above every other name and that at that name every knee should bow every tongue should confess that jesus is lord and the third way we learned to function like god as revealed in christ is sacrifice sacrifice hallelujah greater love had no man than this than a man laid down his life for his friend i beseech thee brethren by the mercies of god romans 12 and verse 1 that ye offer your bodies unto god a living sacrifice holy and acceptable he calls it your reasonable act of worship and so i'm just doing a quick recap because it's important that we connect um we're dealing with the matters that help us to walk in dominion the nature of christ producing the christ-like character and that nature that virtue of the spirit and then functioning like christ so part two would take it a step further and um like i said the subject of altars you'll be learning um i've discussed a few things in time past about the altars but um, my concern now is what to omit and what to leave and so i decided to zoom down on just one area for the purpose of this series i believe that would take an extended time to deal with the subject of altars because in my opinion i think that there is a lot of ignorance among believers and one of satan's advantage please lend me your attention one of satan's advantage as far as um cutting short the glory of the saints is to deceive the saints into believing that um, realities just because they have been wrought in christ they are automatically finished and executed by default they are finished but not yet executed there are rules of engagement as you'll be learning hallelujah so this is very important jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 10 we're looking at tearing down altars this will be part two of greater light tearing down altars i want to teach you how to enforce liberty in the spirit see i have said this day i have said this day i have this day said thee over the nations and over the kingdoms watch the assignment now to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant let's read together now ready one to go see i have this day set thee over the nations uh-huh and over the kingdoms number one and 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 then it says to build and to plant second samuel second samuel verse 20 chapter 24 and verse 25 Shamala glory be to the name of the lord let's read together one to go and david built there an altar unto the lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings so the lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from israel may the lord open our eyes in the name of jesus now just as a background for tonight's discussion the kingdom operates in mysteries the kingdom of god the kingdom of heaven operates in mysteries matthew chapter 13 and verse 11 jesus was teaching and he said it has been given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom he calls them but to them those who are without it is not given the kingdom of God and its operations are hidden in mysteries. And there is an explanation for that. Um, I have taught you that a mystery is a secret code of operation. 
that is only privy to a people who are part of a group are we together now for instance the police force they have a way they operate they have a modus operandi if you are not a police officer trained to understand their language their gestures their codes you may be at a loss whereas communication intelligent communication is happening around you if you're a military man they have their modus operandi they have a way that they speak they have a way that they communicate such that if you claim to be a military man there are questions they will ask you and in one minute they know you are not because it will be impossible to be a military man well trained and not understand that modus operandi are we learning now so they are called mysteries mysteries hidden codes of operation that i are privy to a group of people and among the many reasons why god decided to keep truths light as a mystery is because handling the truths of the kingdom has consequences and demands maturity listen carefully handling the mysteries of the kingdom demand maturity there are consequences to it the mysteries of the kingdom is like holding on to electricity imagine allowing your two-year-old child to hold on to a high tension wire now you can imagine the kind of power that is generated from that high tension wire and yet the naive young child just comes to play and if it's a baby who most likely want to chew anything they hold in their hands if you give a little child a knife he's taking it straight to the mouth are we together because as far as they they understand everything is food they attempt to chew give them money they chew it give them whatever they chew it give them your hand they chew it give them you know whatever theirs is just to chew whatever comes to them it will be evil to know that the baby has those tendencies and then sharpen a razor blade and give it to the baby so you preserve it it is not out of the house it is kept somewhere and as the child grows and demonstrates growth through capacity you begin to introduce the child to other more sensitive matters this is why the mysteries of the kingdom are kept and your authorization to access them is your willingness to grow your maturity per time and per season are we together now so don't assume that just because the truths they are not hidden because god does not want you to know them no they are hidden to allow a certain version of you access them so when you press for growth he begins to release the truth the bible says line upon line are we together precept upon precept in layers you learn the rudiments of the kingdom once you are done you begin to delve into weightier matters the bible lets us know that there are certain kinds of foundations hebrews chapter 6 you find that Paul was saying, having dealt with these foundational elementary things, he says, let us press further, let us press deeper, let us go to perfection. There are layers of truth like light and one of them is what you'll be learning tonight. Are we together? It is amazing that there are many believers and I say this with every sense of humility and respect who are so ignorant as to the other higher levels of light and weightier spiritual matters they just live as victims of the consequences of exchanges that happen in the spirit exchanges that happen within their environment they have not sustained the know-how nor the maturity to participate in deciding their lot in life I'm praying for someone in the name of Jesus that as you hear the truths that I'm bringing to you, may your eyes be open. And may you handle this level of truth that will scale you into dominion in experience. You believe that shout a loud amen. Amen, amen and amen. So let's see how God will grant us grace as we deal with this topic. Um, there are a few foundational truths I want to put very quickly. And then I'll make some recaps. My focus is to teach you how to tear down and to build altars. But uh, the average believer is at a loss completely as to the matters of altars. And the idea that comes to someone, an average believer who may not be trained, uh, when we talk about altars, the first thing we think about is monuments that are built, are seen, uh, you know, through the Bible or are seen. In many cultural practices but it's a lot more than that as you'll be learning so please walk with me as we quickly run through the elementary truths that we need to know so that uh, we deal with the core 
of our matter tonight and we pray. I hope you came ready to pray. Hallelujah. Now, foundational truth number one. Satan only has an advantage over the saints on three grounds. Satan has an advantage over the saints only on three grounds. It's important you know this. That every time you see Satan attempt to strike, destroy, oppress any individual, any family, any believer for that matter, even if in Christ, there are only three grounds as revealed in the Bible that authorize Satan or gives him a loophole into the life and destiny of believers. Number one, ignorance. Please write that down. Number one, ignorance. The first ground upon which Satan can met out his rebellious activities, his activity of stealing, killing, and destroying in the life of believers is called ignorance. Number two, disobedience. Disobedience. These are foundational truths you must understand. Number one, ignorance. Number two, disobedience. Number three, covenants. That Satan has only three grounds upon which he attempts to deal with the saints. Number one, ignorance. Ignorance of the truth, the ways of God. Number two, disobedience. Refusing to comply with the terms that commit God. Number three, covenants. Of all of these three, the most far-reaching in terms of its effects are covenants. The reason is because in many regards, ignorance has a personal consequence to an individual and most often stops at the individual. Disobedience can affect an individual, perhaps extends to a few people, but covenants are transgenerational. That means even when the individual who was actively involved in setting up that system is no longer there, it becomes a law that the realm of the spirit recognizes no matter how long. Are we together now? This is very powerful. Ignorance, disobedience, and covenants. The Bible is scattered all through mentioning the subject of altars. And we see the patriarchs from Genesis down even to the New Testament. The ideas may change, but the, the concept of covenant has remained consistent all through scripture. We'll just walk through a few scriptures just to give you a scriptural frame that this subject of covenant is scriptural, is deep, and demands anybody who wants to walk in dominion and understand this business of victory, victory over demonical forces walking in the blessing of the Lord in experience. It is impossible, no matter who you are, you cannot reign in life if you do not understand altars. Genesis 8.20, that is the first mention in the Bible of the word altar. So we'll run through a few scriptures to give you um, a doctrinal understanding. The Bible says, And Noah builded an altar. You have that word there? Unto the Lord. And he took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings where? On the altar. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. Please walk with me as we write. The Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto your seed. Watch this now. Unto your seed will I give this land. And the Bible says in response to what God said. Abraham did not just say I receive. And then to start dancing around. He, the Bible says he built an altar. In honor to that statement. Who appeared unto him. Genesis 13 from verse 8. Genesis 13 from verse 8. Did I get that right? I think I must have missed something. Uh, let's go to Genesis 26 and verse 25. My apologies on that. Genesis 26, 25. This is Isaac now. The Bible says, and he builded an altar. Are you seeing that now? That Abraham taught his son Isaac that the way dominion happens in this kingdom is by understanding altars. Isaac built an altar there 
and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tents there and there Isaac's servant built a well. It was about a well, but he focused on an altar. It was about a well, digging a well to make for sufficiency, but not without an altar. Genesis chapter 35 and verse 7. Genesis 35 and verse 7. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. This is Jacob now. We see the concept of altars. You see Abraham, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These are models. Every single one of them was taught that dominion within their time cannot happen without the awareness and to know how to engage this mystery of altars. Who is learning already? I'm showing you consistent in scripture. First Samuel chapter 14, please, and verse 35. First Samuel 14 and verse 35. Now we get to Saul and the Bible says, and Saul built an altar unto the Lord from Noah to Abraham to Isaac to Jacob down the line. I just jumped this for reference. I can show you literally in almost everyone who did business with God, everyone who became mighty and commanded every level of dominion, there was an altar. Go ahead. Please give us that scripture. He built an altar unto the Lord. The same was the first altar that he built unto the Lord. And of course, we considered already 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 25. David now, there was a plague over the land, Israel, and people were dying and there was, I mean, there was defeat imminent. And he said, no, this is not about being a warrior or not. There must be something. Ah, you will learn a lot tonight. May God open your eyes. The Bible says, and David, as a cure to the plague, he built an altar and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings so the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague stayed from Israel. What is an altar? What is an altar? Let's recap on a few definitions very quickly. An altar is a place, a platform, or a system, a place, a platform, or a system where the spirit realm makes contact with the physical realm on legal grounds. An altar is a place, an altar is a platform, an altar is a system where the spirit realm makes contact with the physical realm on legal grounds. On legal grounds. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 1, I think from verse 10 to 11. Luke chapter 1, 10 and verse 11. Luke 1, the Bible says, the whole multitude of the people were praying without outside at the time of incense. Verse 11, there appeared unto him the angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. The angel came and he was standing at the right side of the altar. There was a basis for the angel to visit. Are we together now? Now, there are deeper explanations, but I'm cutting a lot of things because I want us to quickly get to the business of what we need to deal with tonight. But it's important for you to know that when we talk about the word altar, don't allow the word to just create a lot of complications. It means a place. It means a platform. It also means a system where the realm of the spirit and the physical realm make contact on legal or legitimate basis. Now, as you know, man was created by God as spirit. Are we together? And that spirit contains solical faculties of will, emotions, and intellect. And that spirit with the soul is resident within a body. Are we together? It is that tripartite manifestation that gives man the legitimacy to function upon the earth. That any entity that does not have a spirit living in a body 
with solical expressions is considered illegal upon the earth. Are we together now? From the time God builds that system, it became illegal and it became illegitimate for any spirit, including God. He bound himself with that law that he cannot just come as spirit into the earth to do anything at all. There must be a system that honors that, that compatibility. Are we together now? Yes. And that's where the concept of altars came in. The concept of altar is man upon the earth as the legitimate custodian, the legitimate steward on earth, giving the realm of the spirit access to do any kind of business within the earth. And it would not be considered illegal because man who was now given stewardship over the earth has his participation there. This is very powerful. It means every operation you find upon the earth today, spiritually speaking, with physical effects of course, whether you consider them legitimate or not, based on the provisions of scripture, that it is powered because a law was honored. A human vessel came into partnership with spirits. Are we together? Dead or alive, that became a gateway and authorization for spirits to act within a life, a family, a predefined territory on legal basis. So altar is a place, an altar is a platform and a system where the spirit realm makes contact with the physical realm. Number two, an altar is a platform that authorizes laws and spirits to function upon the earth. An altar is a platform that authorizes laws, L-A-W-S, spiritual laws. It is not only spirits that are given access through altars. Laws are given access through altars to function. It's a platform that authorizes laws and spirits to function on earth. Can I give you a third definition? Number three, an altar is a platform where covenants are activated and maintained. An altar is a platform where covenants are activated and maintained. In fact, where covenants are initiated, activated, and maintained. Add that down, please. A platform where covenants are initiated, where covenants are activated, and covenants are maintained. Covenants must be initiated. They must have a starting point. They must be activated to give them the power, the legitimacy to be acted out and must be maintained, creating sustainability. Hallelujah. Now, I wrote here, and you may recall, that altars can be physical monuments as we have in the Old Testament. Stones with all kinds of things on it. Altars can be institutions. An institution can be an altar. Altars can be men individuals themselves an individual can be an altar hmm. altars can also be non-material platforms like ideas and suggestions ideas can be altars suggestions can be altars so the bible says we cast down every high thing and every thought there are systems of authorization so I'm saying that altars can be physical monuments as we find in many traditional, especially trado-African practices. Altars can be institutions. Altars can be men. Altars can be non-material platforms. Altars can also be thoughts and ideas. Now let me tell you the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone you see in Bible days, in modern history and even today who is
demonstrating any level of sustainable dominion in righteousness i can tell you that that individual has mastered the art of rebuilding righteous altars please listen carefully or is a beneficiary of someone who has mastered the art of rebuilding altars there is no dominion without the knowledge of altars there is no true liberty if we do not know and learn how to tear down altars hallelujah altars allow all kinds of spirits to find expression upon the earth and among men all kinds of spirits demon spirits are not the only spirits that function upon the earth angels are spirits the holy spirit is a spirit god himself is spirit hallelujah there is such a thing called the spirits of just men and there are people who have been granted access to such visitations it is in the bible that we see that elijah moses and elijah remember the mount of transfiguration are we together now yes it was not just a vision because the prayerless disciples saw it so it was not that they were praying and their senses were heightened they were sleepy yet they saw it they said ah this one that elijah and moses have appeared let's prepare a blanket for them because i'm sure they'll be tired after praying you can imagine their thoughts but at least they saw it altars allow all kinds of spirits please look at me ladies and gentlemen there are all kinds of spirits in this venue right now there are all kinds of spirits in our families there are all kinds of spirits in nigeria africa and all of them have a basis for their coming a basis for their function and a reason for their coming are we together now when jacob slept pay attention please i'm building on something that is very important he saw a ladder that was ascending and descending and if you read earlier you know chapters right at that place lost that would later be called Bethel his Abraham his father had built an altar there are we together now and many years later it had become a portal a gateway angelic activities were happening ascending and descending all the spirits that cause mayhem you see they don't just come there is there is a negotiation that happens families are not just oppressed with all kinds of spirits no they don't just come they are invited it's a negotiation that happens and only those who know how to get to that table and wipe some old pages and say it does not know what matter what happened before my arrival but now that i am here there needs to be a legal basis of stopping certain things emotional proverbs like one day gobeta is a total waste of time not in the presence of altars the business of dominion is the business of altars spiritual transactions negotiations that translate to victory or defeat only Yeshua will reign forever to his kingdom there'll be no end only Yeshua will reign forever to his kingdom there'll be no end let's hurry write this down the major assignment of an altar I want you to start that statement for those who are watching those who are following we are discussing tearing down altars the major assignment of an altar any altar at all is to give authorization to give continuity or discontinuity to any spiritual activity on earth whether godly or demonic i'll take it again you need to get this definition down the major assignment of any altar at all is to give authorization to give continuity or to bring discontinuity to any spiritual activity on earth whether it is godly 
or it is demonic. Powerful. The assignment of altars is to give authorization. Number two, to give continuity. Or number three, to bring discontinuity to any spiritual activity upon the earth, whether it is godly or demonic. Who is understanding me so far? So that altars have a singular assignment to give authorizations, to give continuity, or like we'll be learning tonight, to bring discontinuity to any spiritual operation. In one word, an altar is a platform. In one sentence, an altar is a spiritual negotiation table. An altar is a platform. It is a spiritual negotiation table. When we talk about altars, don't let the name confuse you. We are talking about spiritual negotiation tables. There are two kinds of altars essentially based on the results that they produce. There are two kinds of altars. Let's hurry up. Based on the results that they produce. Number one, there's what we call evil or demonic altars. Evil or demonic altars. We are classifying altars into two based on the results that they allow to happen to an individual based on the results they allow to happen to a family, based on the results they allow to happen to a church, a ministry, a nation, a community. Number one, there are evil or demonic altars. What does this mean? A system of authorization that allows the operation of darkness to prevail within a life, a family, a community on legal grounds. I'll take that again. That an evil or demonic altar is a system of authorization set up to allow the operation of darkness, demons, operations of Satan within a life, within a family, within a community on legal basis. Demonic altars. Demonic altars causing mayhem consistently causing setbacks consistently please look at me there are individuals there are families you will be learning who are victims of these demonic altars there is absolutely nothing they do that works give that person a job his creativity is there his intelligence is there but in the presence of a demonic altar something will happen within that company that brings the person out to such a person, favor or defeat, or whatever, it makes no difference. Whether you give the person money or leave the person in that situation, the lot has been determined already. Because like you'll be learning, altars have a voice and their voices give instructions and the realm of the spirit obeys their instructions to the latter. If they say destroy, that's the instruction that will happen until someone else says restore if they say create setback among all the men even if it's after 100 years that is the result that is the instruction that will be obeyed altars have voices and the realm of the spirit once it is legitimate it will obey it someone came tonight and as I'm teaching, there's an anger rising in your spirit because this negotiation table, you have to join today and say, no way, it comes to an end. This evil speakings against my destiny, evil speakings against my family, in spite of the fact that I am safe, I am not yet walking in the experience of liberty. Evil or demonic altars. You find the presence of these altars in lives, in families, in communities. Do you know the reason why, like you'll be learning, we have invented a name for the consistency of obedience to the instructions that altars bring. We call them patterns. Patterns is an instruction that the same outcome must manifest in the life of people within 
a predefined family a predefined region that is why it doesn't matter whether one person is in america and another person is in russia it's the same experience they will have because it's an instruction coming from the realm of the spirit are we together evil altars demonic altars number two we have what we call righteous or godly altars this is the second category of altars righteous or godly altars someone watching online you need to ask someone around your house to come and sit down and listen because this is an answer to the many tragic situations happening around many families godly or righteous altar like the negative side, it is also a system of authorization that is set up, watch this, to allow the operations of the Holy Spirit, the operation of angelic forces, the operations of the Word of God to work profitably for that individual or that family. A righteous or godly altar is a system of authorization a system of cooperation set up that allows the Holy Spirit, that allows the angelic realm or angelic beings, that allows the word of God to work profitably for an individual. The Bible shows us clearly that there are these two kinds of altars. Judges chapter 6 please, 25 and 26. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Koinonia, follow carefully, take thy father's young bullock, this is Gideon, and even the second bullock of seven years old, it says, and throw down the altar of Baal. Did you read that in your Bible? There is such a thing called the altar of Baal. That altar was funding something that was happening in the life of God's people and oppressing the people. Are we together now? It says that who built it? Your father. Read it there. That Gideon's father, sincerely maybe, built that altar. And most likely, perhaps, maybe the person that was even gone already. And yet the altar was still speaking. There were people who were profiting because of this altar. God himself said it's called the altar of Baal. He says, cut it down by the grove that is in it. And then when you are done, he says, now build an altar unto the Lord. Don't leave it there. Two kinds of altar. Because in any case, if you want things to change, you don't just tear down. You also build up. Now you understand what he told Jeremiah? That I have set you over kingdoms and I have given you power to tear down, to uproot and then to rebuild. Let's finish that scripture. It says, build an altar unto the Lord upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the groove and then which you cut down and so on and so forth. So we see here that there are demonic altars and there are godly altars of righteousness. This is very powerful. How do you know that an altar is functioning in a life? I will tell you. How do I know what kind of altar is at work or is powering the results in my life? You can know the presence of an altar in any life by the consistency of patterns and occurrences that happen. The consistency of patterns and occurrences that happen. The consistency of patterns and occurrences that happen. Whether positively or negatively, the consistency of patterns that happen, widespread poverty, widespread prosperity, widespread increase, widespread defeat, widespread open doors, everybody in the family, 10 children, one is in South Africa, one is in Nigeria, one is in America, and all of them are mysteriously prospering. Of course, doing their due diligence, but that there is a mysterious force backing them. Consistency 
of patterns and occurrences. Please lend me your attention. There are various kinds of occurrences that believers can use to test the presence of altars and to test what kind of altar is speaking in your life. Hallelujah. I think it was when I was doing let them have dominion or so I thought about a few things that can can follow people there are families their own issue is mysterious occurrence of sicknesses bodily infirmity to the point that medicine has agreed today that you literally there is through genetics there can be transference of problems is that true a doctor can look at you and say high blood pressure do you have a case of this in your family you say yes so yes my father died of high blood pressure my grandfather died of high blood pressure or my grandfather died of prostate my father died of prostate and they say ah you're a young man that means you need to begin to manage this let me tell you the truth once you see consistency of occurrence is beyond willpower there is an altar there is an altar how about those who never have longevity of impact? They will start, but they never finish. Something eventually destroys them. If it's in ministry, there will be one trouble somewhere. Some trouble, some scandal, some, something that tears them down. If he's a businessman, one trouble in one day, he can turn from grass to grace. So you find out that when those people achieve things, they can't celebrate it because they suspect that the story is not over. And they are right. Once that altar gives an instruction, even if it's after 30 years, you will crash like rain coming upon the ground. Only a shoe will reign forever. To his kingdom there'll be no end. Only a shoe will reign forever to his kingdom be no way. Hallelujah. Now please, I want you to be very comfortable to listen tonight and don't take my teaching personal. There's no point finding any offense. Are we together? Yes. There are people like that. I've seen brilliant people who love God with all their heart at the point of writing their final exams. When counseling them, they will tell you after conducting tutorials for others, they just blanked out like that. Until everything was done, it was as if they came back. What happened to me? There is a speaking. An instruction was given in the spirit like father, like son, like mother, like daughter. Listen to what I'm saying because God sent me. Someone needs to be free this night. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, these altars, how many of you know that what you call IT today, it was built based on the system of altars. It's a programming, it's an algorithm. How do you own your laptop? The laptop does not know you, but it knows instructions. When you press the power button to you, you call it a power button. But at the back end, there's an algorithm that makes the laptop behave a certain way if you press that button. Anybody that presses that button, it will obey. That's how it is in the spirit. Are we together? Isn't it amazing that technology has borrowed from the system of altars? They literally, without being there present, they can use algorithms to not just predict, but explain things. It's been used today to create all kinds of things. Business is literally, the social media runs on this concept, altars. Hallelujah. Now, the problem is that if it is unfortunate for you, you can know what instruction was given in the realm of the spirit for your defeat by the patterns that happen. To others, it is not sickness, but they will never make it. It doesn't, if you try to help them and you are not powerful, that altar turns to you and fights you. Have you seen people like that? Now, this is where sometimes the prophetic makes a mistake. So they say certain things like, ah, you have this lady or this guy or this friend or this boss or this um, um, employee brought bad luck. They are not lying. They are trying to explain that the people were innocent, but they do not know that every time men come together, they bring it's altars that come together. It's not just individuals. When the devil wants to destroy you, 
he looks for what is deficient based on the speakings of the altar fighting you and finds another person who has a speaking that will produce a double problem and bring both of you together now you may not know what the confusion is about beyond men men are conveyors of altars and these altars carry instructions are we together do you believe what I'm, I'm teaching you this is very powerful so you find out that there are certain altars that are like embargoes on people you 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 become part of a business the business starts going down and it's not a product I'm not, now listen 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 there is a place for lack of diligence and non-compliance to the laws of success are we together my discussion is with respect to the fact or based on the assumption that all other factors like diligence and hard work is in place are we together because if you are lazy perpetually even that act of perpetual laziness is sponsored by an altar is supposed to keep you non-productive for a reason there are families as soon as someone rises everybody starts becoming sick and the nature of the sickness is such that it will gob all the money and until they get into debt then something happens either the person dies or many other people become sick once there is poverty nobody becomes poor once they don't have money or nobody becomes sick once there's no money but let a breakthrough just come it's like an alarm system in the spirit and things begin to happen some of you keep wondering why is it that it is when certain things happen it's like there's somebody watching me it is not somebody it's a law the law is precise it does not get tired don't allow ignorance destroy you and <clears throat> well hallelujah Just when your boss wants to lift you, this altar strike again and the devil uses your face to oppress the man. He wakes up in the morning because he does not have spiritual intelligence. He assumes it is you. He just comes to the office. Sad, you said I should meet you. Don't come to my office again. And you are wondering, what did I do wrong? My brother, it's not what you did wrong. It's what was there before your arrival. That if you do not understand and deal with, you will live a defeated, you can be jumping and say I'm born again. You are right. But you see, activating your liberty is based on rules of engagement. Who is learning? You detect the presence of altars by the consistency of patterns consistency of negative patterns i have seen people who either by their own making or because god brought them into a family where they enjoyed a covering their lives began to speak such profound blessings you would see that the woman is only cleaning her job maybe she did not go to school she's only a sweeper but do you know, the day she's sweeping, that's the day a big man will pass and say, I, I like the way you are sweeping. I've been thinking of someone to bless among the sweepers. How many children do you have? Four. Send them to me. I want to sponsor them. And you see that happen. By the time you are angry and say, let's move her to another department. You move her to another department while she's scrubbing the toilet. The man who will help her comes to ease himself again. Is once you see consistency, this is what Jacob carried. Laban said, no, we switch this thing, the result is still the same. Because there are patterns. And it is a product of altars. Laban tried to cheat him. Laban tried to double up. He did not change anything. Because there is an instruction. They are taken for a prey and none say it, restore. Listen, let me tell you this. I don't want to bore you with history. I'm doing a, a summary. It's, it's paining me that I'm jumping so many important things. But I want to tell you this. You don't have to be bad or evil to be a victim of evil altars. For most people, they came into fraternity with dark powers in ignorance. They were sincerely looking for help like some of our great grandfathers they were not evil people they needed their crops to be produced they needed protection from wars 
they had all kinds of diseases that would strike them and they would die and there was no advancement in medicine and the only way they knew was through priests and mediums they would tell you that there's such a person this whole community come into a covenant the spirits will protect you in return your children children to the fourth generation will serve them and the innocent parents said fine it's a negotiation table the realm of the spirit witnessed it you were still in the womb of eternity when it happened but the realm of the spirit is precise like your phone number it will find you no matter where you go except you know how to rebuild an altar that secures you listen i wish i were lying to you this work of ministry bar ministry is like medicine you have the opportunity to talk to people one-on-one -on -one. you have the opportunity to examine very serious situations by the privilege of god's grace not just by study i have seen firsthand the presence of altars i have seen people there have been people myself that i vowed to help and in a mysterious way i forgot i had to pray and say no this can, this has to be demonic and they say, sir, I'm not offended. That's how it has been. It's been like that. Nobody who says you will help me, that you even remember is a miracle. So when you tell some people receive favor during miracle service, don't blame them for not lifting their hands. They are used to pain. They know instinctively that there is a voice. You see these things happen even in marriage. Wonderful, beautiful lady. A gentleman just comes. How are you? Let me see your parents. Uh -huh. The altar does not touch you when you are in school. Go and read. If you like, become a professor. The altar was not programmed to speak against your education. It was programmed to speak against the children that come from you. And then you find out the day you want to go and see your parents, something happens. You hear that the man just became mad. He didn't just become mad, my brother. You see that? everything that is not of God everything speaking over everyone's life programming trouble in the name of Jesus you must be released this night <laughs> hear me there are negative speakings and the instruction is that no child must bury their children it is no parent must bury their children it is children that, that bury their parents. So you get into a community, the oldest person is 45 because there is no length of days. You get into another family and the old people remain old, but they never have children. Where are the children here? Something always happens and they just die. Do you know, if you don't have spiritual intelligence, if you like become a pastor, you stand on stage sincerely preaching Jesus with all your heart. Those altars don't care. The only thing that brings them down is light, not sentiments. Hallelujah. I have watched this thing destroy people. I've watched it destroy good people. Good people. Good people. Great grandmother was raped mysteriously and she loved the Lord. The mother did not hear the story and did not know the story. But as she grew up, something happened. Maybe as a house held, she was still raped again. Now the daughter, third generation, they are not even aware. They have not discussed the story with one another. The day they now discuss it, they are all shocked. Different actors, the same instruction. The same instruction. There are others who have destinies of kingdom financiers. Their great-grandparents were colleagues with those who are billionaires today. It was in their prophetic destiny to be financial apostles. But there was a speaking. They would tell you that some of the, before all this bank started, my father was in the meeting. And you are saying, where is your father now? He's dead. Why are we in poverty? They will show you pictures of them and the founders of companies. But there was an instruction, never rise beyond a certain height. Listen, I know what I'm saying. If I'm cracking jokes with you, I will crack jokes and we'll just laugh. So you find people that when you speak with them, you are asking, but sir, 
Your issue is not laziness. Your issue is not lack of productivity. Why are you at this level? Because with the kind of value you have, you should be at the presidency or you should be at UN. And they say, my brother, it's not only me. My grandfather was a genius. He graduated with first class. My father was a this. I have PhD. All my four ch children have PhD. But nobody can bring a decent meal. I remember many years ago in Port Harcourt, I met a woman truly wrapping up her PhD. She was working as a security person because she had to make ends meet. Hallelujah. Please sit down. Sit down. You can detect the presence of altars. I'm not scaring you. There is a way out. But I want you to think for one moment. The many things that have happened around your life. Mysterious, consistent evil programmings. Whether towards you, whether towards your family, whether towards those you know. And sometimes it becomes more embarrassing when you are a Christian. This is why you must learn to walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible says there remained a rest for the people of God. He's not talking about unbelievers, but that even for the people of God, there remained a rest. Look at me. There are people, and I don't, I don't want you to get sad. Like I said, don't take it personal. How many of you know that there were people in this Abuja when land was 500,000? Till today, they don't own a house. It was not carelessness. Something tied their hands. They attended every seminar on real estate you know. They even helped to facilitate it. Till today, they don't have a house. When houses, when lands today that are hundreds of millions of naira were just less than one million. And it's not that it was lack. Some of them even had breakthroughs. Doors were open. Five million, ten million. They cannot tell what they did with the money. Until today, their children are begging. You are passing a road and they'll tell you, you see this federal government road? It used to be land that I would have gotten at a platter of gold. What then happened? Life is not as haphazard as you think. Life is not as sentimental as you think. Let me tell you the truth. Life is largely a product of programmings and instructions. Programmings and instructions done by you or done on behalf of you. Instructions and programmings that produce blessings, that produce troubles. Number three, and this is where I want to focus on tonight. How to uproot demonic altars and how to set up righteous altars. This is what I want to dwell into. How to uproot demonic altars. I hope that another time when we have to discuss, by God's grace, I promise you that we'll do justice, we'll revisit everything again so that you will learn this concept of altars. I'm under the shadow of your wings Your influence is all over me I am under the shadow of your wings Your influence is all over me Yeah I Let me 
it show you the operation of altars Romans 8 verse 1 open our eyes oh God in the name of Jesus Shalimara Sobrantika Palako Sebrekitis Krato Sali Karindoski Malahaski and light there is therefore now no condemnation please pay attention now to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit please read verse 2 with me as loud as you can one two go one more time so Paul is saying I have now experienced liberty but that this liberty has dynamics 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 I'm seeing fire rising from the ground I'm seeing fire rising from the ground In the name of Jesus ah, tonight God is judging altars judging altars in the name of Jesus I'm still fire rising just like rising from the ground in the name of Jesus let me speak already anyone who has been bound by any satanic any demonic altar in the name of Jesus as you hear me speak now may those influences over your life give way forever give way forever give way forever please be seated be seated let's hurry up are we together so the Bible says first three words Romans 8 2 for the law for the law the word law L A W D is an interesting word that I want us to consider it doesn't mean the principle it doesn't mean law like Old Testament. The word law there is the word operation. Replace the word law there with operation. Then you understand it now. For the operation of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the operation of sin and death. You get, you get it now? So he's not just speaking of laws. He's saying there is a programming. That's another word. For the programming of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the programming. So what put him in bondage? Programmings. What brought him liberty? Programmings. Are we together? There is an operation that leads to the experience of liberty. There is another operation that leads to and keeps an individual perpetually in bondage. Now, People are victims of programmings. People are victims of not just circumstances, but programmings. There are laws. Paul is saying the law of the spirit. Are you seeing that he had to use another law to replace another law, another operation? There was an operation called the law of the spirit of sin and death. But that for you to experience liberty, they had to bring another law called the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus. And that is what set me free. Now, I've told you that evil altars and all demonic altars can be pulled down. This is something you need to know. All evil altars can be pulled down. And all righteous altars can be set up in place of those evil altars. So know that for a fact that no matter how long an evil altar is, it can be torn down, it can be pulled down, even tonight, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, write this down, please. Altars walk by speaking instructions in the spirit that must manifest in your life if allowed. Altars walk by speaking instructions. That means every altar has a voice. Altars walk by speaking instructions in the spirit that must manifest in your life if allowed. 
They walk by speaking instructions. They program instructions in the realm of the spirit. Those instructions are executed by spirits, executed by men, executed by systems and structures for their final delivery to your life, good or bad. Tearing down altars. Now, I taught you something that I want to quickly recap so that you understand. There is something called the reflection principle in theology. Please look at me. They call it the reflection principle. That means everything happens because of something it submits to. Are we together now? So the moon shines because it submits to the light and the glory of the sun. Are we together? When you see a tree grow, spring forth and is producing fruit, there is still an invisible part to that tree that you do not see and that is what powers the tree are we together now so the health of the tree or the health of the root is reflected in what produces the kind of fruit the kind of um uh, you know good structure that you see on that tree he shall be like a tree that is planted so because of where it is planted and the nourishment it gets from it it will now become like a tree that is flourishing are we together now i said that to tell you that Every altar, evil altar, now please look at me. There is a central altar that powers every evil altar. You need to know this. There is a central altar that powers every evil altar. That means it doesn't matter which family those evil altars are speaking from. There is a central altar that powers those evil altars. And it is called the altar of sin. And iniquity the altar of sin and iniquity the altar of sin and iniquity and there are three levels of sin very quickly now number one there's personal sin personal sin shortcomings as an individual number two there are territorial sins it is not something committed by an individual but it is something that is territorial, like Nineveh. Are we together now? If you were Nineveh, even if you were a baby, you will still suffer. Are we together? There are times that the concept of sin that attacks the people is not personal sin. You can sin as a person. If we say we have no sin, the Bible says we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Are we together? But if we confess our sins, the Bible says God is faithful and just to forgive us from our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there are territorial sins. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and heal their land. There are territorial sins. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis chapter 18, when you read from verse 21 to 23, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not just the sin of an individual. It was a territorial sin. Number three, there is sin based on foundation and bloodlines. Sin based on foundations and bloodlines based on foundations and bloodlines. I think that should be Psalm 11 verse 3. Give us Psalm 11 verse 3 and let me see. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the... Not what can men, what can the righteous do? Even the, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? This is very powerful. So all evil altars depend on this one altar to be able to function is called the altar of sin and iniquity you know what that means if the altar of sin and iniquity is destroyed all other altars cannot be powered they depend on the strength of this existing altar to fund and receive their energy to manifest that means no matter how you destroy, you pray, you bind, you cast individual altars. Once this altar is still at work, sin and iniquity, this altar 
whether personal, territorial, or through bloodline, you will not be able to do much. It's the reason why people pray and shout sincerely and it looks like the realm of the spirit has no regard and has no respect for what they say. Now, very quickly, all godly altars similarly are powered by this one major altar. It is called the throne of grace. The throne of grace. There is such an altar where God sits himself is an altar. It's called the throne of grace. This is the altar that powers every other altar. The throne of grace. The throne of grace. The throne of grace. The throne of grace. There are many things that happen in the throne of grace. One of it is the blood of Jesus. I think Philippians 2, 12. Ye are come unto Mount Zion. Verse 12, he says, um, did I get that right? Hebrews chapter what now? The blood that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. Find it for me, please. Ye are come unto Mount Zion. <coughs> the blood of sprinkling. Thank you. Unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, 23. To the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect, 24. Yeah. The, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, all found there, that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. There are things that he speaks better than the blood of Abel. Now, please listen carefully. If you cannot access the throne of grace, there is no basis for powering any other authorization. The realm of the spirit only respects your speaking to the degree to which that speaking is connected to the throne of grace. The Bible says we come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need to come boldly to the throne of grace so that we may obtain mercy mercy is found at the throne of grace and the grace to help in time of need is also found at the throne of grace are you learning so far now listen carefully please you stop the speakings of satanic altars by raising up another altar you stop the speakings of satanic altars by raising up another righteous altar that speaks consistent with God's desire for you. You stop the speakings of satanic altars by raising up another altar. Now, look up please. Today, altars for us is not to rebuild stones and physical monuments are we together yes altar for the believer today in Christ listen carefully there is a big difference when Abraham Isaac and Jacob spoke of altars they meant physical monuments with animals upon them sacrifices as demanded by God but today we don't do all of those things unfortunately and I say this with all due respect I hear that there are many believers or pseudo christian sects that are still involved in building physical monuments with all due respect it's not mine to condemn anybody but consistent with the word of god those things have been abolished the idea of altars for the believer now is not rebuilding physical things like putting a stone behind your house now i know that most of us have for instance what you call your prayer altar and what you mean is a room or a place you have dedicated unto God. That is fine. Provided you don't idolize the place. Are we together now? Yes. If it's a place for convenience, dedicated between you and God to spend time, that is fine. But where you now idolize it and it looks like you cannot meet God any other place and you create a ritual out of it, it now becomes destructive. Are we together now? Because worship today for us in Christ is not just in a place. It is a state, a spiritual state beyond a place. You can be in church and yet you are not in church because you are not really there. Are we together? 
Jesus said, a time will come, you will neither worship on this mountain or come here or do this and that, but that the Father is seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is more concerned about a state beyond a place. You can be in the right place, but not in the, with the right heart. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, the Bible says they were gathered in one accord. They were in one place, but they were in one accord. Their accord was greater than the place. The Holy Ghost did not come because the name of the place was Upper Room. It was the state. There was a state of unity and expectation and faith that allowed the Holy Spirit to come. Are we together now? So there's nothing wrong in having a place dedicated in your home, your office, and so on and so forth, provided you do not build monuments out of it. But now, I'm teaching you that there is a system. When the believer talks of altars, you are talking of speakings and programmings. Listen carefully. Speakings and programmings. Speakings and programmings. Not physical objects. So when I say... I have an altar. That means that your speakings and your programmings, are we together? They have become consistent enough to create instructions in the realm of the spirit that are pro-destiny, pro-kingdom. Are we together now? Yes. If you tell me you have an altar, meaning you build some stones, it doesn't matter where you brought the stones from. Are we together? There are so many things in my house. I have a simulation of the Ark of Covenant. It was given to me as a gift. So you see the Ark of Covenant. I don't worship it. It's just there to remind me that we have come a long way walking with God. Are we together now? If I'm eating bread and it falls on the Ark, I'll carry it and keep eating it. I'm not going to throw it away because it fell on uh, my Ark of Covenant. No, are you getting the point now? So it's beautiful. I like to see it. You know, it reminds me just, I have all these things around my house, eagles representing this, lion representing this, but you don't worship it. The challenge is when you now build a monument and now come and stand kneeling down in front of it, ah, you have gotten into idolatry. You are worshiping an unknown God. Is someone learning now? I'm saying this because there have been all kinds of teachings about altars. And so that you do not generalize, there is a unique thought that we are trying to establish here. That altar for a believer now is not just about physical monuments. Even though, truly, the altars you may be cons considering, wanting to tear down, may have physical expressions with priesthood managing it. But that you do not counter that altar by building another physical monument. There is a more superior way of approaching it. And this is what I want to show you now. Pray in the spirit in one minute and ask the Lord to open your eyes. In the name of Jesus Christ. We look to Yahweh, Yahweh. Our hope is Yahweh, Yahweh. We look to Yahweh. Yahweh, our hope is Yahweh, Yahweh. Are you praying? We look to Yahweh, Yahweh. Forever Yahweh, Yahweh. Hallelujah. Right? How to tear down altars and how to rebuild altars of righteousness. We've established so far that with respect to the outcomes that these altars produce in the life of individuals and families, we have demonic or evil altars, we have godly or righteous altars. Altars being platforms, being tables of negotiations. Hallelujah. So when you say, I have an altar, it means you have created a platform and that the platform is created for the believer through words. Don't forget. Altars are built through words, largely, principally through speakings. Altars are built through words, not just physical monuments. Now, there are actions of obedience, and I'll come there, but the principal way that believers build altars is through speakings. Now, there is a law in the spirit I want to introduce to you now. This law was honored even by Jesus is called the law of substitution. 
the law of substitution. That means that there can never be a void at any given time. When there's no darkness, there is light. There can never be a time where there is neither darkness or light. If it's not morning, it's night. Are we together? Are, are we together now? Yes. The law of substitution. So, the law of substitution says that with respect to this now, watch this now, that you cannot stop outcomes by stopping them. You stop outcomes by replacing what should be. Are we together now? It's, it's you are substituting evil for good, not stopping the entire process. The concept of altars was so designed that at no point in your life should there be any void. That means if there is no personal altar set up by you, the altar before becomes your status quo. Are you getting the point now? You don't have to consciously set up a negative altar. If you do not rise up to define your possibility, any altar available can hurt you and harm you. For instance, you don't need to plant weed. No, the seeds are scattered everywhere. All it takes is for rain to fall and you begin to see weeds grow in your farm. Are we together now? But there is a way that you can see certain farms and gardens manicured. It looks like weeds never come up. It's not true. The potential for weeds are there. It's only that the gardener has taken responsibility to do something upon that farmland every day. So in your experience, you never find weed there. But it does not mean weed cannot grow. Are we together? If at any point the gardener is careless and leaves the farm, then you find out that weeds grow. So you can discover a garden that for one year, you never see it bushy. And based on your experience, you believe that weeds don't grow. Weeds can grow anywhere. But the gardener, if he's not putting insecticides, he's mowing the grass, he's doing something, there is an action that is being engaged to keep that garden that way. It's called the law of substitution. Now, please look at me. Most believers, and, and I, 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 I say this with humble submission, humble submission humble submission most believers have been taught to tear down altars and then not have any altar around their life again so whether by prayer by breaking of curses generational curses whatever it is and so they say in the name of jesus i am free and then sometimes we men of god sincerely after praying for the person the person falls rolls on the ground and then he stands up and he says that's it, you are done. Go, you are free. Um, you are right, but you are wrong. Do you know why? Because according to the law of substitution, there must be a voice speaking. An altar must be speaking at every given time. If it is not the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, it is the law of sin and death. There is no such thing as void. Where nothing is happening, neither good nor bad, it does not exist. Maybe just in the mind of the individual. Who is learning so far? I'm saying this because there is a responsibility component to administering liberty that if the saints are not taught, they will remain defeated. It doesn't matter the kind of deliverance that is conducted. It doesn't matter the breaking of yokes and curses and whatever it is. Refer to my message, Complete Deliverance. I teach you there that there are three levels of deliverance. Number one, casting out the spirit influences. And then number two, there is what we call deliverance through transformation. The ministry of light. Transforming you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the final phase is called the discipline of conformity. Where you have to now use your will, empowered by the grace of God, to walk in keeping with the factors that keep those spirits at bay. Show me anyone who practices these three things. You will experience complete deliverance. For most people, their focus is the first area. Man of God, pray for me. I have bad dreams. Or I have all kinds of patterns. Please help me. And truly, you pray for the person cast out that spirit and then the person is free and the person returns back you know why the demons are not afraid because they know 
that there are two other steps that were ignored. Deliverance through transformation, the discipline of conformity. So after praying for that person, if you're a man of God here, learn this. When you minister to someone and is free from demonic spirit, you don't just tell him, okay, that's all. Whether you are serious with God or not, whether you are serious with church, just go. He will experience momentary testimonies. By the next week, he will return back and say, you are such a powerful man of God. You prayed for me that week. I experienced promotion but the spirit still have a legal access to return because the programming in his mind remember my teaching that your mindset is your contribution to your own failure or your own success your mindset that has not been renewed can partner with those spirits and attract them back again hallelujah are we learning now so you stop the speakings of altars by raising another system of authorization that speaks something otherwise. So for instance, an altar that speaks untimely death, an altar that speaks defeat, watch this, an altar that speaks sicknesses, an altar that speaks failure, an altar that speaks all kinds of trouble. You don't just say in the name of Jesus, I've come by the blood, I destroy this altar, it will never find place in my life again. Uh -uh. What else are you speaking? The Bible says the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things. Not speak another, not, not just speaks. Something was speaking before it came. Since the blood of Jesus was not there, the blood of Abel was speaking. And the blood of Abel speaks judgment. The blood of Abel speaks vengeance. Are we together now? Yes. There's no time to go there. You would have seen that when Cain killed Abel, the blood of Abel was speaking. And it spoke and God had it. He came and said, Cain, this blood is crying to me to speak vengeance. And on account of that, a curse was released upon him. He even had to cry and say, it's too much upon me. Everyone that sees me will hurt me. And a mark was put upon him. Even at that, he still became a fugitive and a vagabond. It was Cain, according to scripture, that was the first spearheader of the campaign of rebellion against God. After the fall of man. The Bible says Cain knew his wife and she bore him a son called Enoch. Are we together now? And now they built a city. He built a city after that name. That was what eventually graduated to what you would call the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. I speak the blood, I speak the blood, I speak the blood. I speak the blood, I speak the blood, I speak the blood. I speak the blood, the blood, eternal cleansing blood. You don't have to cry, cause he has paid the price. I speak the blood, I speak the blood, I speak the blood. I speak the blood, I speak the blood. I speak the blood, the blood, eternal cleansing blood. I don't have to cry, cause you have paid the price. Listen, what I'm about to teach you now is what I did in my own life. It's not what I was taught, it's what I practice. I'm praying that your eyes will be open. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. For someone, a way out has finally come for you. If you do not understand the law of substitution, you will never be able to silence the voices of evil altars. And you will never be able to walk in dominion. Number one. The first key. When you want to tear down altars. You must also be ready to set up a righteous one. If you are not ready to set up a righteous altar. Then do not waste your time trying to tear down one. Did you hear what I said? 
every time you are tired of the speakings of an evil altar and you want to tear it down then you must be prepared to take the responsibility of concurrently setting up a righteous altar that must be initiated by light maintained by discipline number one the first key to tearing down altars is breaking the hold of those demonic altars by engaging the blood breaking the hold of those demonic speakings breaking the hold of those ordinances breaking the hold of those demonic altars or speakings by the blood by the blood by the blood by the blood who is learning you want to tear down demonic altars the first thing is not to start speaking oh my life is no 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 you are dealing with something serious and you are dealing with something that is on a legal basis i remember when i was doing um let them have dominion if you recall i taught you something that i want to repeat very quickly please look at me god forbid but let's assume i'm, I'm an armed robber and i come or I came to steal in your house do you know the moment i hear the sound of anyone what will i do i will run away because i am stealing it's illegal are we together but let's imagine that someone lied to me that your house were his house are we together and that he could give me access to it and i now paid for it if i hear you coming will i run away no there is a legal basis so when you are dealing with legalities in the realm of the spirit there are rules of engagement are we together now you don't just cast and bind spirits arbitrarily please look up please look up as much as we love to cast and bind is the reason why our casting and binding does not produce results because when demons are operating based on altars there are rules of engagement not even jesus christ casted sin out of man as powerful as god is he did not cast sin out of man he had to come down to the earth are we together because a law is that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin and not even god as jesus christ could bypass that law are we together so when you want to dismantle evil altars the spiritual instrument that is responsible is the blood of Jesus my God I wish I had the time do you know why because you see the blood of Jesus is not the color red take that out of your mind that's not what we're talking about the blood of Jesus is not just the liquid that falls from a man even though there is a physical expression to that the blood of Jesus is a summation of the revelation watch this now the revelation behind he's becoming sin who knew no sin that an unjust man a just man took upon himself the cloak of being unjust are we together and that by that that spiritual law he died a death he did not deserve are we together now and that the basis of that death he did not deserve was that the man who deserved to die in him can now find liberty so every time you invoke the blood what happens in the realm of the spirit is that a memorial is raised are we together now that memorial echoes the fact that an unjust man went through something i mean a just man went through something he should not go through that means no matter the basis of the accusation because of the liberty that just man has brought you are free that is the thing about the blood you have to understand this now most believers shout the blood of jesus but they don't even know what they are saying all that just mean the liquid the red liquid of jesus like that thing you transfuse to a patient who is not feeling well you will never get a miracle that way blood is an instrument of mercy to you but an instrument of justice before judgment most people think the blood is an instrument of judgment no it's an instrument of justice it raises a memorial the judge himself being god not satan he is the judge of all the earth so every time the ministry of the blood is invoked 
that memorial is raised in the heavens how that a just man sinless became sin carried the sin of all the people are we together every accusation brought upon Jesus was false so that every true accusation upon you by his verdict you are also free so Satan has a name with respect to the ministry of liberty he's called the accuser of the brethren when it has to do with liberty watch this he's no longer a thief Satan is not always a thief he changes according to what he tries to achieve when we talk about justice you have to go to the court the high court the very court that the judge at that point God does not just sit there as creator he sits there as judge the judge of all the earth the accuser of the brethren comes are we together and that he accuses the brethren day and night what is the accusation I have a right to oppress this family the reason is that the grandfather called me through the spirits and the mediums and he said empower our farms in return I will give you all the female children in this family and I have maintained agriculture they have produced all the, you know from their farms I have maintained my own part now a young lady a young guy because he came for koinonia he's asking me to lose my 150 year old grip over that family it does not work that way watch this so if you now come and say well I think you must go no the system of justice must have a basis answer judicial people even when they met out judgment it is not based on sentiment according to section this subsection this this is the penalty that follows such a thing are we together do you know that in the court of law now I'm not a judge but I know this much that in the court of law you can have the truth but if you don't know how to communicate it you will still go to jail so having the truth is one thing knowing how to communicate it in a way that relates to the laws that govern you bring forth your strong reasons bring forth your strong reasons why should Satan take his hands off your life because you are tired of him you are joking why should Satan leave your family and your destiny alone because you are tired of him no sir there is only one basis for the liberty of the believer Christ Jesus and the sacrifice Christ Jesus and the sacrifice if you bring yourself and your righteousness the realm of the spirit reminds you that there are three kinds of sin personal sin territorial sin and sin from bloodline you may be free from personal sin but how about the territory you are part of a territory can sin it is still sin so when you stand before the judge of all the ages the basis of that victory is the speakings of the blood the moment you bring the blood into the equation every accusation doesn't matter how many years doesn't matter every decade because you see listen when God judges he judges based on who he is not based on the situation there when God judges he judges based on his person and the Bible says the Lord is gracious and compassionate you have to understand this he's slow to anger and he's rich in love God does not desire that any man perish this is the character of the judge are we together now the blood leverages on the integrity the very nature of God with respect to what has been done in Christ once you engage the blood watch this now Satan has nothing else to say because the basis of Satan's operation is the fact that a human will was part of that negotiation are we together now somebody agreed Satan you can invade this family and now you are saying he played his own part of the deal gave them whatever they were looking for fame or whatever it is now grandfather is dead now father is dead you have come into Christ and the Bible says those things should not hold on to you again just believing that they will never happen is a joke 
there are rules of engagement this is what i'm teaching you rule number one is that you must know how to engage the blood someone say the blood one more time say the blood so every time you say the blood of jesus don't just think liquid are we together now no think justice mercy to you or for you but justice translated as judgment to every other power ah, this is powerful 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 yes may rama chia do wata banda wani se kai yes may rama gahawa ye na banda wani se kai yes may rama chia do wata banda wani se kai Apostle, but your grandfather worshiped idols. Maybe you yourself even worship idols. And the Bible says, the soul that sinned, it shall die. It shall die if it does not come to the mercy seat. There is something called the throne of grace. You know one thing with the throne of grace? There is no qualification to get there. Christ is your qualification. The throne of grace does not have any entrance exam you write. You come. That is the throne that you can come as you are. Provided it is when you come that you encounter mercy and you encounter grace to help in time of need. Who is learning now? Look at me. Let me tell you the truth. I got to a point in my life where I took a careful examination of my life, my family tree, the realities that were before me. And I knew that I needed to dismantle a lot of altars. A lot of altars. You've heard my story. As a man of God, I was being oppressed by demons. Not many people will be honest to tell you this. People will just hide and make it look. It's a lie. There's no point hiding. Vulnerability is not weakness. That there was once upon a time. And because... Of the privilege of the prophetic I will be lying down in my room and I will watch these spirits enter it's not I, I'm not talking of it's uh, you would see them I shouted Jesus like the Bible says I should shout it and they seem to be unaffected I knew that mm -mm, God has to be true there is something I do not know how could the name of Jesus be so powerless no then I found out that the name was not in the chanting of it the name was not in the pronunciation. Mm -mm. <laughs> I remember engaging do you know I would lie down to sleep and have these demons press me I could hear people speak but to wake up it was drama I dreaded night times because the moment I do you know it got to a point where I would lie down at the edge of the bed it doesn't matter how wide the bed is I would lie down at the edge so that at least I would try it would look like I was suffocating to die Come on now. Altars. They are real. Oh. They are. You believe me on that. They are real. They are real. I know some of the healthiest people in the world. They, they, they are meticulous about anything 
but they hit a certain age bam and suddenly they will tell you it looks like there's some pain somewhere and they tell you cancer or they tell you some prostate or they tell you one demonic something you're lying down one day you just collapse and as healthy as you are you take orange every day banana every day they still say you have low blood pressure what must you take then there are people who stop eating rice 10 years ago they are still sick they stop eating cassava they stop eating yam I'm not saying I'm not giving you a medical advice I'm just saying what is left what is left no rice no yam no eggs no plantain no cabbage no nothing no liquids whether you are fasting or not these programmings have vowed that you must die what you need is the blood the blood the blood that father I come to you by the blood not in my righteousness that every demonic installation that predated my existence the Bible tells me I can bring forth my strong reason and I come to the judge of all the earth I come to the judge of all the earth I come before the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things hitherto these altars have been speaking negative things over my life over my family but I come by the blood and I invoke the blood the blood upon altars it doesn't matter what programming I, it, it may not be your fault it's not a cause to come from the family you came from but you need to do something about it now before it tears your life into pieces let me tell you the truth please look up one of the biggest challenges with the church is that we're not entirely honest with ourselves we are more conscious of our reputation than dealing with what needs to be dealt with so there are many people who have all kinds of troubles sicknesses they are hiding troubles that they should deal with it and we just carry this fascia of things working well victory is real there's no point faking it if it is not working take responsibility and iron it out in righteousness someone said the blood yes sir the blood because for some of you based on the description you are supposed to be the next physical priest right now as a medium to carry that thing based on the description whether you know it or not and there are some of you there's this demonic thing now uh, do I go into these things hallelujah that you engage the blood you engage the blood you engage the blood that by the blood of the eternal covenant my grandfathers may have made their choice my great-grandfathers may have made their choice but this man I have decided as an act of my will listen 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 now please listen listen I want to teach you how to do it and I want you to listen to me in establishing your case before the court of heaven there are two bases only two I want you to please listen number one the first basis for establishing your victory is what Christ has done. What Christ has done. The blood that was shed upon the cross. The victory that is in Christ. The sufferings of Christ. The substitutionary sacrifice. There you go with the word again. If you ever approach the realm of the spirit advocating liberty from the negative speakings of altars and it is just based on your fasting or based on your prayer i'm not saying those things are wrong or based on church attendance any other basis outside of the sacrifice of christ is not valid enough the parliament of heaven was only designed to honor the sacrifice of christ and whoever becomes a beneficiary of it through christ the second basis is the power of the will I'm teaching you the rules of engagement now the power of the will this becomes the basis of your making a defense before God that God gave everybody the power to choose so what is happening in my life 
is not a reflection of my choices and God is bound by his integrity to give me a chance to make my own choice. Who is understanding this now? So that believers must have spiritual intelligence. You don't just say, God, I'm tired of this trouble. You are in heaven. You are watching all of this. Do you want the devil to kill me before you're happy? You, all that lamentation does not lead to victory. There are two bases. This is how to approach the judge of all the earth. God is father, Abba, Bata. But when you are advocating liberty, you are approaching your father who is the judge. And you must know how to speak the language of the court of heaven. The basis for victory, number one, the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus. The blood that speaks better things. The blood that has annulled everything. Calling you out from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Lord, it is true that I am Yoruba. It is true that I am Hausa. It is true that I am Igbo. But when I came into Christ, I was grafted into a new kingdom. And it becomes unfair for me to be a victim of the foundational limitations that came with my natural descent. Are we together? The first birth, I didn't have the power to choose. So now in Christ, the second birth is by choice. The first birth you appeared. Who is understanding this now? You are speaking the language of justice. So in addition to the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ, the Bible says, I set before you life and death. I set before you blessing and cursing. But these spirits are not giving a room for me to choose because it looks like the oppression vetoes my will. Therefore, God has to come in and give me a chance. If I use my own will and I choose destruction, then that becomes my lot. But until then, everyone on earth by God is given an opportunity, even if based on the law of time and chance. The blood, the blood, the blood. I am no longer interested in serving the idols that were served before me. I am no longer interested in that discussion that happened across the table. Did you hear what I said? I am no longer interested because I'm a child of God. Because I'm a child of God. And because Satan is a stubborn spirit. He's not just going to say, ah, okay, I've had you. Mm -mm, he's not like that, oh. It's not like that. So, the blood. Number one. Let's finish up. I'm showing you how to dismantle demonic altars. You will break the hold of demonic speakings by engaging the blood. The basis for that is the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus. Are you ready for step two? Step two also doubles as how you rebuild an altar of righteousness. You must engage what we call the covenant of sacrifice. And listen carefully, I'm not talking money. Pay attention so that you don't let the devil cheat you now because some of you are very, very interesting with matters of money. Once you hear sacrifice, aha, there he goes. Mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> the sacrifice we're talking about here is not money at all. The business of your destiny is more serious than Naira and Kobo. Are we together now? Did I speak about repentance? Yes. Part of breaking demonic strongholds is to also repent on behalf of yourself and on behalf of those connected to you. Without repentance, the blood cannot speak. I hope you know that. The blood does not speak indefinitely. The blood does not speak arbitrarily. The blood is sponsored by a broken heart. The activation of the power that is contained in the blood is sponsored by a broken and a contrite heart. Father, I come before you admitting that my grandfather buried 30 virgins, buried 20 children. I admit the fact he may have gone, but in the name of Jesus, the Bible declares that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and that the truth is not in us. I come in genuine repentance as one who has obtained mercy in Christ. And upon that ground, even the finished work of Christ, I advocate mercy over the legal speakings. You see that? Then number two, the covenant of sacrifice. Let's deal with that because I want us to pray. Now, the covenant of sacrifice is a very serious covenant. It is not a one-off covenant. Please listen, everybody. 
the covenant of sacrifice is the other parts to this equation of rebuilding altars that many believers have not been interested in the covenant of sacrifice is not a one of sacrifice please listen is not a one of sacrifice it's a sacrifice that must be initiated activated and maintained consistently if you want to walk in the reality of victory hallelujah the first object you are going to sacrifice if you want to rebuild an altar of righteousness that perpetually shuts every evil altar is your life your own life Romans 12 and verse 1 you want to rebuild an altar of righteousness the first sacrifice that it demands is you total surrender total surrender I beseech thee, brethren by the message of God that ye present your bodies not just your spirits who is learning your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable sacrifice now look at me there are many believers who do not want Satan to have a legal claim or a hold of their life but a part of them is still not dead to Christ for as long as there is still a part of you that is not interested in the things of God Satan still has a hold the Bible says Satan come to me Jesus is speaking now and he come to me and found nothing there are many believers today when Satan comes he will still find something that gives him a legal basis the sacrifice of your life do you know there are people who want to be delivered but not to be born again they are not interested in being born don't talk to me about being born again don't talk to me about being serious with God just cast out this demon and let me go how much is it if you need money I can give you unfortunately the first sacrifice is not money it is your own life a committal to knowing Jesus loving Jesus living for him all the days of your life if you are not prepared look at me how many of you know that every altar is maintained by priesthood I didn't teach you that priesthood is the spiritual system that maintains altars are we together now it fans the coals the ambers so that those speakings continue when the priesthood that powers an altar fails the operation of that altar will fail the altar is as powerful as the priesthood that keeps it you know thriving and for many people they do not know that every altar that speaks against you has men and systems that have literally sacrificed their lives I want you to believe this there are people who don't do any other thing except to maintain altars and there are strict demands some of them because of the kind of office that they have to maintain those demonic altars there are times they don't see the sun for one week for whatever it is you see the men looking as if they are dead but they tell you this is the priest in charge of this altar are we together the law of sacrifice is a non-negotiable condition your entire life Lord I offer my life since I'm not going to serve Satan I will follow you holy since I'm not going to serve Satan I will follow you holy there's no such thing as I won't serve Satan and you too I'm still considering you are with Satan immediately automatically the altar returns who is understanding are we together I won't serve Satan all right choose you this day Lord I'm for you with my life I pledge my life to serve your purposes I belong to you this is the decision that many people have not made today is the reason why their advocacy to be free from the speakings of altars still has a hold of them when we challenge people to be serious with God is beyond just going to heaven it is engaging this law of sacrifice are we together sacrifice if Baal be God serve him if God be God serve him 
And Elijah says, let the God that answer by fire, let him be God. When it was time for destruction, Moses, who is on the Lord's side, this way. Any other person, if you are not sure, you are on the other side. And every one of them, the earth opened and swallowed them. I've been captured by a love I can't explain. Now you have me and I'm forever changed. I've abandoned everything I've ever known. Now I surrender. This life is not my own. I belong to you. I belong to you. I belong to you. I belong to you. My life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself, give myself. That my life is not my own. It's a realm in the spirit called Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life that I live today in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Believers, please hear me. For as long as you are still playing games with the altars that are killing, stealing, and destroying, it's a matter of time. It will catch up with you. Your real freedom is on your becoming the living sacrifice. Before your prayer, before your fasting, before your giving, your life. Who is learning tonight? There are people who will come to church, even if the series is rapture, they will never be born again. They will watch people cry and say, Kai, this thing touched me, oh. but make an altar call. They will never come out. Now, I'm not condemning you, but listen, let me tell you the truth. You are authorizing these altars to destroy your life. And let me tell you how God delivers families. Kai, this thing, ba, I, I feel so pained in my heart. God, God will grant us grace. We'll revisit this thing. Every time God wants to step into a family, he does not call all of them. He waits for the first person who shows interest in him. Did you hear what I said? The first person. So what God does when he wants to deliver a family is to set up a burning bush. And he will wait for five years, for 10 years. As people are growing, dying, moving, one day somebody will turn and see that burning bush. I want to show you how it works. Now that first person who turns, God will say, please come. I've been wanting to visit this family, but I cannot force you. I've been creating the burning bush, the dreams you've been having, the visions you've been having. The prophetic words you receive in the bus as you are passing, all of those things are signs. Signs. Now listen. 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 All God needs in every family is one representative. One. It could be more. And it's great if it's more. But one. Out of a family of idol worship, here comes a young lady, frail lady, came for koinonia God born again in koinonia and God says regardless your gender can you give me a chance we, we I need to use your destiny on a project there are things we need to clean up there are things we need to work on else your children and your children's children will have these patterns because there is a voice speaking hallelujah finally after much convincing, he finds one lady or one man 
or one old man because no one else was available or one young teenager because all the youths are busy looking for money but in any case let him find one man that's it from that one man he now says Moses you will be a deliverer but the way you are now you can't go to Pharaoh I can't send you this way you are ill equipped the destiny is to advocate an exodus so all the trainings that I'm subjecting you through is not for yourself I'm speaking to someone now for five years you've been in the school of the spirit it is the making of that deliverer because there are not many in your family who are willing to give God a chance now that he's found you he doesn't seem to let you go he's insisting on you insisting on you insisting on you insisting on you insisting that you must carry that anointing insisting that you must build that capacity insisting a sacrifice of your life a sacrifice of your life building that capacity building that formation equipping you with the tools because you are going to be confronting altars altars older than you altars older than your grandparents altars older than your parents now the question is who is willing to give God a chance with your family give God a chance with your life to say Lord like Isaiah here am I send me make me then send me let my mother not die make me and then send me let my father not be destroyed my siblings may not be as spiritual but before they catch up I am available This cause of poverty over this family, I am available. This cause of women not remaining in their husband's homes, men not remaining in their wife's home, this cause, this cause of untimely death, this cause of mysterious sicknesses, this cause of being a graduate and there's no job, no product, no matter what it is. Lord, I am available. I am available. I'm available. My intent is for every one of my family members to be saved and used by you. But you can start with me. You can start with me. King of glory, you can start with me. You can build me. You can make me. You can furnish me. I don't mind the fire. I don't mind the furnace of affliction. Let it make me like the porter and the clay. Build me until I become. Me. Someone pray. Something is happening here already. Take a minute, just one minute to pray. Pray. One of those nights, I was praying and fasting, crying out, and then my ceiling just disappeared. And I saw this creature, giant creature with eyes as big as the head of a human being, red fierce eyes, looked like a dinosaur, having a tail that had its own life. And it was looking at me and it spoke to me. It said, so you think you want to bring God's people into abundance? I said, so this is the spirit. I know that lack of productivity leads to poverty. But make no mistakes about it there are spirits there are programmings that enhance poverty there are people who have the boat the net the fishing skill but they never catch fish their issue is not laziness when i saw that i said this is it i will never serve the gospel begging for bread i will never raise a people begging for bread but i confronted that spirit I saw him, he saw me. Thanks be to God. Every devil knows what victory is. This thing is beyond buying and selling. Oh, 
there is a realm where you stamp some things in the spirit and you return back to the earth and it will be as if you are holding a charm on your hand men eager to favor you doors opening for you and people say you are lucky no you are not lucky you are victorious victorious is the word not lucky victorious hallelujah listen you've heard the story that one time I had this vision and I was serving people bread there was some machine sit down for one moment there was a, a machine that was manufacturing the bread and the honey but I was the only one who was seeing it and there was a long queue of people and then I would hold the bread and put honey in between and people were queuing and I would give it to them and they would eat and go and gather their family members and return back they thought I was the one making the bread but I was the only one who was seeing the machine it just makes the bread and cuts it mine is just to hold and serve and I saw that I said this is it this is the mystery of sufficiency having enough to give at all times because there is an energizing that though invisible is real there is something God can do to a man that makes you sufficient at all times hallelujah now I love my family I love where I come from but I saw certain things that happened to the men that I said this thing has to be stopped especially the firstborn men now I know to many people it doesn't matter they say it doesn't matter well save Johnny thank God everybody has his destiny to live but it does matter you see let me tell you how Satan operates he does not strike at all times especially when he sees pride when he sees pride he allows it to grow so you would think you are free because he has not come he can be patient for 10 years allowing your pride to bloat you call it victory then one day he hits you in a way that you will now say so that school of the spirit I jumped this is what is happening to a lot of people a lot of people think because the devil has not come around their vicinity they are free many gyrated and made that kind of noise some for 20 years some after 30 years in ministry 35 years in ministry just when they thought they were about to rest he said no the altar still speak he came there's no taking chances with this thing better verify that what you call liberty is liberty indeed so that you are not celebrating shadows in ignorance just because the devil is quiet does not mean you are free i'm not glorifying satan i'm opening you up to the truth dominion cannot happen if you do not understand altars whether it is satan you want to serve or god there must be altars there are covenants with god by the mercies of god that run this ministry you see there are altars there are speakings there are things God said to do that if it is done this ministry will never go down there are things in the Bible we learn generally but there are personalized instructions one of them is if you can let men see me there is nothing I will not give you if you can hide behind the cross and leave this blind pursuit of fame this blind pursuit of name, man of God, MOG, run away from that deception. And I said, That's it, Lord. For you to be lifted high, all I want is for you, for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted. All I want, you know someone no, no, I'm saying this just just to joke with my people someone made a statement and said he's watched all our revival meetings he said we arrange a program like koinonia there's no special introduction to Joshua Selman and I'm saying there's nothing wrong with introduction I say if I go to preach somewhere else they can introduce me but I don't have time for that it's just my it's not it's not like it's wrong I don't have that time at all once it's time to preach, I wait impatiently. Once it's my turn, get out of the way for me. Let me do what I was born to do. You see that now. Now, it may not apply to everybody, 
but I'm telling you one of the things you learn in rebuilding altars please listen I'm about to make a statement now there are truths you will find from scripture but in rebuilding a personal altar God is going to demand certain specific covenants from you that is not general if this does not happen to you you are talking to a familiar spirit not the God of the Bible if it is the God of the Bible are we together now in rebuilding a covenant there are secrets and mysteries unique to you that he will give you and these instructions may not make sense to everyone that's why you do not teach it as a doctrine if you teach it as a doctrine you will confuse people and mislead people because he can bless you but can destroy another and depending on the gravity of the assignment the instructions can be so strict even to your personal life it is true there are times because of the nature of the mantle and the oil you are carrying God will tell you my advice for you you cannot have more than three children you can have as many but this is my terms with you if you want to host this grace as safe as possible these are the terms the degree of compliance is the degree to which you will command power within creation now you can't go around telling people if you have more than three children you are wrong no but this is your personalized dealing for some God can give you an instruction and say because of what I'm telling you you cannot have 1,000 2,000 houses around no no matter what it is I need a certain level of consecration from your life that protects this oil that's why I call it the covenant of sacrifice let me tell you this we live in a world that disrespects people's covenants with God because when you see certain things happening it looks very cheap it looks very easy but behind the exploits of the saints there are both unique expressions of obedience from scripture and personal covenants sometimes strict inconveniencing covenants hallelujah if you will let men see me there is nothing I will not give you you think I'm not human that I want we have the level of influence to program a system of fame for myself but you can choose to do what you want to do and reap the consequence of disobedience or you can choose to hide behind the cross and allow that fire to continue to burn who is learning let's find a place to pray so number one your life the second way to engage the covenant of sacrifice I'm showing you the ways to engage the covenant of sacrifice number one by offering your life I hope we're still together number two through prayers Leviticus chapter 6 12 and 13 the second way you engage the covenant of sacrifice in dismantling demonic altars and rebuilding and sustaining godly altars is to engage the ministry of prayer as a lifestyle why the ministry of prayer because prayer affords you the platform to verbalize your will and to verbalize your interest Leviticus 6 12 to 13 let's read together 12 and 13 when you're done writing ready one to go and the fire come on let's read with energy let's start again one to go and the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it it shall not be put out and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning ah. and he shall burn thereof the fat and the peace offerings 13 the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar this is called the covenant of sacrifice you want to command dominion there are three entities that are mentioned there one the altar two priesthood three fire the bible says the priest shall put wood every morning every morning not every weekend every morning you want the altar to keep burning to keep speaking blessings to keep speaking faith you pray not as a response to tragedy 
You pray not as a response to calamity. You pray as a lifestyle, not governed by fear. It is the modus operandi of dominion. So every morning, you are signing that spiritual register. I am a priest maintaining this altar. The altar that speaks favor. The altar that speaks blessings. The altar that speaks speed. The altar that speaks open doors. The altar that speaks ever increasing glory for koinonia. It is found through the covenant of sacrifice. Let me tell you the truth. Like every human being I admit to you. There are times that I get very tired. You have no idea. But it's a covenant. I know I have to get up. I know I have to pray. Sometimes you are tired. I return from meetings. I don't even know if I'm awake or I'm asleep. But in the name of Jesus, sometimes I just cry to God for strength, put my head for a few minutes, but I remember. I remember my destiny. I remember you. I remember the terms God gave me. And it brings energy. Lord, I obtain grace. I must sign that register. Shama kaparagoda. It starts with sleepy eyes. It starts with a draggy voice. But soon, what you see becomes greater than what you are feeling. Let me tell you this. Never stop prayer because you are sleepy. Now sleep, but don't stop prayer because you feel sleepy. There is a supply of strength that will eventually swallow up. Satan knows our bodily limitations. So he will tell you, you are, you are human. Now don't get me wrong. There are times I sleep off. I remember one day I was praying. I knelt down. I'm telling you, I knelt down with seriousness. My Bible was up. I was typing. I can't even remember that I stopped typing. I know I was tired. That's the last thing I remember. And it was not a vision. It was not anything. I just slept like deep sleep, kneeling down there. I just got up and I said, well, Lord, you, you, we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched. Jesus slept on his way to a crusade ground. On his way to a crusade ground. Honest admission. Honest admission. It's not 100%. I sleep, oh. Sometimes you get honestly tired. And while you are praying, dragging, just saying, and mercy, grace, mercy, grace. It's not because that's the only thing you know. It's just that that's the only thing that can sustain you at that time. But you must pray. Most of you have not yet seen prayer as a covenant, as a priesthood duty. So when things are fine, you don't pray. Until there is tragedy, then you quickly come. That fire brigade epileptic spiritual lifestyle cannot produce dominion. Pray for me, pray for me is good. I'm committed to praying for you. But let me tell you the truth. Everyone must leave this place knowing that you don't rebuild an altar by putting stones. You rebuild an altar by putting in the wood every morning. You wake up. Father, thank you. In the name of Jesus, Shalika Parantoski Aparatosiata. This is the day that the Lord has made. I speak into this day. I speak into my children's day. I speak into the day of my husband, my wife. I speak over my parents. They are unbelievers. I'm trusting for their salvation, you may say. But Satan, you have no hand in their life. I stand as a bridge. Before they meet Christ, they enjoy the safety. Who is understanding this? Now, let me tell you this. One of the reasons why Satan stops people from coming to church is because he knows that there are certain battles in the spirit that you cannot fight alone. You will need higher graces and you will need the corporate anointing. So you may be doing well in terms of your personal prayer altar, but there are times that you need to come to the house of the Lord. Are we together? And under that intense corporate anointing, you are encouraged certain victories and certain results are wrought in your life. When we invite people to church, it's beyond just membership. It's beyond just gathering a crowd for a name. It's an advocacy to see. It's like an ark. It's like Noah's ark. Someone say, I will pray. You see the reason why Satan insists on prayerlessness. Don't say I'm not the prayer type. That means be ready for negative speaking from altars. Nobody is born the prayer type. You make yourself so by revelation. Go back home this night and whilst you sleep, don't snore yourself into the morning. 
thank God for technology. An alarm clock is there. Don't say the Holy Spirit will wake me. That's irresponsibility. You have not gotten to that level of maturity. And even if he wakes you, your, your indiscipline will not allow that to happen. So don't tempt God. Get your alarm clock. Sanaka parantos kia baratos, rakate barika katos yata. If you are if you, sleeping on your bed is causing you to sleep and get up, start moving. Shanika parantos kiata, rekete baratu kasia. You are starting the day. Carry your files. Lay your hands on it. In the name of Jesus, I am a businessman. I go forth with joy. I am led forth with peace. I decree and declare that creation hears my voice. I attract destiny helpers. I declare by the power of the Holy Spirit that no enchantment, no divination against me can work i stand it is for freedom that christ has set me free in the name of jesus i declare that i'm not going back no ordinance of darkness no arrow that flies by day no noisome pestilence against me and mine will prosper i am beulah i am hepzibah i'm like a well-watered garden all who see me seek to bless me because the hand of the lord is upon my life the wisdom for my days at work in me the priest putting fire upon the altar and the man gets to the place of business and finds out that in an extraordinary way God is helping you you frustrate Satan when you create that prayer life the covenant of sacrifice is engaged by the sacrifice of your own life wholly loving the Lord and serving the Lord number two the covenant of consistent prayer as a lifestyle Prayer points or not, consistent word-based prayer. And then number three, giving. The third way you engage the covenant of sacrifice is giving. And giving is also threefold. Your time to serve God, your energy to serve God, and your resources to serve God. Unfortunately, pastors seem to zoom down on the resource part. I don't know why. But greater than the money, you want to be free from demonic covenants and rebuild an altar that speaks blessings. You must give your time to serve God, your energy to serve God, and then your resources to serve God. Hallelujah. In spite of the fact that there are conferences lined up, there are people to see, there's whatever to be done, I must do my due diligence as a man of God over you. And once we are done, regardless how tired I am, my whole life belongs to him. Time, energy, resources. I don't compartmentalize my life. There is no aspect of my life that belongs to God and then another belongs to me. Everything belongs to him. So when Satan comes around my life, he finds out that I am God's property completely. The part of you that is not God's property is the part he will attack. Hallelujah. Are we together? Everybody say giving. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. If it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Let's read the last sentence loud, clear, with faith in your heart. Ready? One to go. But as for me... One more time. Me and my house means me and my business. Me and my house means me and my company. Me and my house means me and my vision, ministry. Me and my house means me and everything I own, everything I have, everything under my care must serve my God. Are we together? You cannot serve God and your business serves idols. No. You cannot serve God even if your children or your spouse is not yet serving the Lord. That should become your prayer assignment. Lord, in their lifetime, let them be saved. We rebuild altars, tearing down old ones by number one, breaking the hold of demonic altars, demonic speakings by engaging the blood through repentance and through administering the blood. Number two, we engage the covenant of sacrifice. The sacrifice of our lives, giving ourselves wholly to God. The sacrifice of prayer. Prayer. 
And I hope you know prayer goes with light of scripture. Your prayer life is as rich as your knowledge of the word. If your knowledge of the word is poor. So when I talk of prayer, I'm not saying to choose prayer against scripture. That, that is already defeat. What gives strength to your prayer life is the strength of your spiritual understanding. And then number three, giving. Your time, energy. I tell you this and I submit to you in the name of the Lord as we wrap up. I made a covenant with God that there is nothing I have today, especially resources, that does not belong to Him. There is no kingdom project that this ministry or any ministry I know and love and respect that wants to be part of and I have a chance to be part of it that I fold my arms. And it has nothing to do with having all the money in the world. It is a covenant. If you don't use your time to serve God, you will use it to serve Satan. If you don't use your energy to serve God, you will use it to serve Satan. If you don't use your resources to serve God, you will use it to serve Satan. You may not serve Satan by serving Satan, but you will serve the needs that he brings for you. The endless needs that translate to pain and disappointment. This is what I did with my own life. Everyone who has experienced true liberty in Christ, this was the pathway. I did not pray, I still pray. I did not give, I still give. I did not just commit myself to God. I still commit and rededicate my life. Show me a believer that is ready to engage this, to engage the blood in genuine repentance, denouncing the works of darkness. Are we together? Advocating mercy by the blood. Number two, show me a believer that understands the covenant of sacrifice, the sacrifice of your life, wholly loving and following the Lord. The sacrifice of, um, what's the second one again? Prayer. Engaging the prayer altar. And number three, the sacrifice of giving of your time, your energy, and your resources. I show you one person who has put an end to the reign of darkness. Like that gardener who will never even give weed a chance to grow. Because in this life, demons, we are not given liberty to bind demons and trap them in one place indefinitely. They have a legal right to operate within the earth. And their legal right is because there is still one more person alive who has freely donated his will. Are we together now? Satan should not be an a legal occupant, but because there is one person created in the image of God who has still donated their will, Satan will still latch on that one person to operate upon the earth. Your assignment is not to bind them and keep them somewhere trapped forever. That liberty is not given to you yet. Your assignment is to sanitize your spiritual environment, to drive them at bay, that they do not become interruptions to your becoming, to your serving the purposes of God and living a victorious life. Who has learned something tonight? Our time is up, but spare me five minutes. Let's do some prayer. Please rise up on your feet. Pratina has I'll give you three quick prayer points. Prayer point number one. Father, if there is any legal basis upon which Satan will lay claim on my life, I advocate the blood right now. Please go ahead and pray. If there is any legal basis, if there is any legal basis, the psalmist said, if I cherish iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not hear me. Go ahead and pray. In the name of Jesus. Take a minute to pray. Every legal basis. The sin of commission, the sin of omission. I obtain mercy by God. I obtain mercy by God. Sins of bloodline. I obtain mercy by God. Territorial sins. I obtain mercy from God. Open your mouth and pray with humility and brokenness. One minute. In Jesus' name. 
Now I want you to begin to take authority in one minute. As simple as what I'm saying is I'm releasing my faith with you that every speakings of every altar that is not of the Christ in the name of Jesus be silenced by the blood. Go ahead. Be silenced by the blood. Be silenced by the blood. Go ahead. Pray. Pray. Don't trivialize the simplicity of spiritual intelligence. Pray. Every ill speakings powered by demonic altars advocating defeat, advocating delays, advocating untimely death, advocating poverty, advocating closed doors by the blood of the eternal covenant. I come against you. I dismantle those altars. Someone pray. I come against you. I dismantle those altars by the blood of the eternal covenant I come against you I dismantle those altars attracting tragedies to my life attracting wicked men to my life from one destruction to another from one trouble to another in Jesus name we pray now you're going to cry for grace to engage this covenant of sacrifice Lord grace to follow you holy grace to commit to a life of prayer consistently and grace to dedicate my time, energy, and resources to serve you. Go ahead and pray. Grace. Obtain that 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 grace. Sapela kaparanta kapera kosevra ketepelekepa. Obtain that grace. In the name of Jesus, obtain that grace. Grace to follow the Lord holy. Grace to follow the Lord holy. Follow the Lord holy. Grace to commit to a life of prayer. Speaking realities daily. Rewriting stories daily. Declaring my will daily. Making my contributions to the manifestations of God's word in my life daily. Obtain the giving grace. The grace to give God your time. The grace to give God your energy. The grace to give God your resources. Not by manipulation, by revelation. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to make the altar call quickly we're out of time and then I'll speak over your life and we're done I don't have to cajole you after such a service you need Jesus you need Jesus quickly you need Jesus now the power of the cross the power of the blood is the key I told you that every demonic altar is powered by this central altar of sin and iniquity and for someone you came to church as you heard me speak the Holy Ghost began to speak to you make it right with God now I will count one to five leave your seat quickly and come and stand here one God bless you God bless you don't give Satan a chance with your life God bless you come come God bless you God bless you perhaps you may be the first God is counting on to dislodge these satanic demonic altars. 
Don't let Satan win over your life. He's giving you an opportunity to make it right. Come. Don't say there are many people in front. Uh-uh, uh-uh. This is a personal business of destiny. Come. Keep clapping, Koinonia. Let's celebrate them as they come. Apostle, I want to make it right with Jesus. My grandfather could not make it right with Jesus. My father could not make it right with Jesus. But here's my chance to make it right. Here's my chance to give myself wholly and completely to this one who died for me. Come, come, keep clapping. Ten more seconds and we'll begin to pray. If you're coming, make your way, please. Those following online, God bless you as you come. God bless you as you come. No matter how bad things are, Jesus wants to give you a new beginning. Make your way here. Hallelujah. I want to thank all of you for making this noble decision. Listen, everything you've heard me preach tonight is true. And I want you to know that your coming here is an indication that you are closing a door permanently to darkness, to failure, to mediocrity, and you're opening up a new chapter in your life. And I salute your courage, young and old, male and female, thank you. Lift your right hand high above your head. Please say this after me as loud as you can. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I declare that I love you with all my heart. I declare that I cannot help myself except you help me. Right now, I receive Jesus into my heart as my Savior, my Lord, and my King. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. From tonight, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I go forward ever and backward never. In Jesus' name we pray. I pray that the grace that keeps me, that grace keep you. You walk in righteousness and from tonight it's a new story for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Please look to my right, that will be your left. There are counselors who are waving the placard. Do cooperate with them, they will have a word with you very quickly and then you will return to your seat. Let's celebrate them as they go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay. Um, let me just appreciate the presence of um, a dear woman of God, the Deaconess Ibiso Adebifsi, the wife to the Executive Secretary of Living Faith. I understand she's here. God bless you, ma. Uh, okay. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We're honored to have you in our midst. May God bless you, you and all that came with you in the name of Jesus. Are you ready to receive? Let me speak over your life and then we're done. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over everyone here under the sound of my voice. Every altar speaking against your life. It doesn't matter what it is speaking. By the blood of the eternal covenant, those voices and the effects of their speaking come to end now. Those speakings of the altars come to end now. I decree and declare by the power of the Holy Spirit, let a new altar speak righteousness, speak favor, speak blessings, speak advancement, speak restoration, speak increase, speak new levels, speak advancement, speak multiplication, in the name of Jesus, everywhere the altar has spoken death, I speak life. Everywhere the altar has spoken poverty, I speak increase. Everywhere the altar has spoken curses, be blessed. Everywhere the altar has spoken delay, I declare go forward. In the name of Jesus, everywhere you have been stagnated in life and destiny, as a result of this prophetic declaration, let your wilderness become a fruitful field. Let your wilderness become a fruitful field and let your fruitful field become a forest. In the name of Jesus, someone shout it, say, I am free. One more time, say, I am free. For the last time, say, I am free. Give Jesus a big hand clap. 
celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in Jesus name we're off for UK please pray with us remember that um, we're one big family we're taking the power the grace of Jesus to the United Kingdom make sure you connect it's 5 p.m. begins from Thursday 5 p.m. Friday in the morning and then the final session is um, 5 p.m. Make sure you follow all of our social media platforms. Please invite everyone to connect. I'm going to be sharing some things that I think uh, is very important that the Lord placed in my heart. We're trusting God for miracles, signs, wonders, for all kinds of deliverances, for all who are within the United Kingdom, even though the space, uh, physically speaking, there might not be space again, uh, but you can connect online. Connect online with an open heart and trust God to give you a great encounter in Jesus' name. Have you been blessed tonight? Let's share the grace in fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Surely, goodness and mercies follow us all the days of our lives as we dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy liberty. Thanks for watching Revival Time Hub. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was.